So welcome to uh, another edition of our At Monty, At Monty Hart CAF conference. We're going to have a, a discussion today about um, chronic total occlusions and to know more about uh, who we should be selecting for these interventions and when we should be performing them, how we should be doing them. And with us today is our speaker, Dr. Kathleen Kearney, who is an assistant professor of medicine and attending physician at the University of Washington Medical Center. She received her medical education at the University of Pittsburgh and completed her fellowship in cardiology as well as in interventional cardiology at the University of Washington, where she has stayed on to become faculty and has developed an expertise and identity in CTO PCI. Thank you for joining us today and I'll give you the floor. Great, well, thank you so much for having me. So good morning from Seattle. Um, I really appreciate that introduction. I will share my disclosures here briefly, but I think probably the more significant one is that I spent a year really focused on CTO training um, with some of the guys at University of Washington as a second year. So obviously I have a little bit of a, a hammer nail situation, but I think I hope to go through a lot of how we approach patient selection um, and some of the techniques and evolutions that are ongoing there. So really wanted to spend some good time discussing indications for CTO re revascularization, as well as a lot of the reasons that are sort of often highlighted or, you know, kind of excuses that come up along the way um, and how we try to negate that by moving from less of an anatomical approach and more of a physiology assessment of patients and based on symptomatology, et cetera. Um, then we'll also review some of the common techniques in coronary CTO practice, which I think many of you will be familiar with, but hopefully go through some nuances in terms of how um, there's been evolution in the, the field in that space as well. So I think just to start for, with a few things that we hear commonly, um, and I should say that I kind of came into the CTO space as a naysayer as well. I really had no plans of pursuing additional training in the area. I was more interested in structural heart disease from an interest in valve um, research and some things like that. And what it really came down to is I think seeing a lot of the patients that had indications to be treated or had horrible symptoms, you know, came to us looking for help and often, um, you know, it was just from a technical standpoint, it was challenging to be able to offer that to them. And so, um, but I just want to go through a lot of the things that I both thought and heard and still continue to hear from our colleagues. So one common one was that I don't, I just don't see CTOs in my practice. And people say, I don't, I don't really see issues come up. Um, I know they're out there, but you know, I would, I would certainly be more interested if I ran into this on a more frequent basis. And we know from a lot of the registries that CTOs are fairly common in stable ischemic heart disease patients that are presenting for angiogram, in particularly those with a prior history of cabbage. And so some of that, you know, in terms of um, vein grafter ability and accelerated native disease in the setting of bypass, now, these are relatively common findings. And we also know that it's in about 10% of STEMI patients. Um, but furthermore, in the NCDR cath PCI registry analysis from a few years ago, it was under 5% of actual PCI interventions. So I think, you know, sort of the question remains, are we under treating, over treating patients with CTO PCI? And would say, well, probably both. Um, you know, John Spurtis is a smart researcher and um, he looks a lot at kind of patient selection for PCI in general, especially in stable ischemic heart disease. Uh, and he says there's probably the right number of PCI being performed in the United States. It's just that we're not doing it on the right people. And so, you know, we sort of cherry pick based off anatomy, potentially, you know, other things that we get focused on an interventional strategy in, in one patient for whatever reason, um, but that there's other folks that are undertreated with good indications. And so we really just try to go back to the basics of why is a patient on the cath table? Um, we try to prioritize physiology based decision making over anatomy where possible or where we have have that data. Um, and really, it's a shared decision making conversation with patients. And I think that's a big part of uh, what my training was is actually just going through that in clinic. Um, another thing that I commonly heard, or, you know, we sort of look at, or the idea that collaterals are sufficient. And so, you know, folks will come to us and say, well, I was having symptoms, um, but I was told that my body had just sort of taken care of the problem that had been blocked for a long time. And, you know, several years later, when folks are still symptomatic, that this is ongoing. And, and I had heard this a number of times as well. I think it's 
interesting um, earlier in kind of the evaluation of CTOPCI, you know, Werner and others found that largely there was insufficient coronary flow reserve in patients with well-developed collaterals and no prior MI in about 93% of the cases that they looked at in a, a registry. Um, they also, as soon as they basically crossed the CTO, then exchanged out for physiology wire, um, normalizing the order, et cetera. And in those cases, about 75% of those were relatively okay at rest, but there was significant coronary steel and a third from the donor vessel when they evaluated that as well. So I think that's a common, um, it's an important thing that we have to look at. And sometimes it's the moderate disease in the LED that's applying collateral. So the RCA, for instance, that seems to matter. Um, I highlight this case. This was a gentleman post-cabbage, um, very sick inpatient that we were referred uh, with advanced heart failure. And when he came in, we were trying to assess, you know, what to go after. And he had an LED that we couldn't see in an atretic lima. Um, so, you know, I said, well, there's no way that the LED could be viable because we just can't see it. And at least on his thallium, which was all he was eligible for in terms of viability testing at the time, his anterior wall actually was lighting up pretty well. And his inferior wall was, an, was the territory that was really not showing up on the viability testing. Despite this, this was an epicardial collateral off a graft to the circumflex coming through here, but this looked larger than any of his other coronaries. And so I think um, you know, it's important that we just have to recognize that we can't always assess everything just from the angiogram itself in terms of what's important. Uh, I think you know another thing that came up quite frequently, I was actually pimped as a first year cardiology fell in the cath lab uh, by an attending who said, we found an RCA CTO and he says, well, um, we don't treat these, do we? And I said, no. <laughs> he said, why? And I said, uh, I think the OAT trial. Um, he said, right. So we kind of went through that in terms of, you know, these occluded arteries, if we open them up after the fact, there's, there's no benefit. Um, you know, I think from a trial perspective, you know, there's a lot from that that we can learn and also some obvious, you know, differences from our current practice. I think the biggest one is that this is, you know, an apples and oranges comparison. In general, these by, by definition were not uh, chronic total occlusions, but rather acute occlusions that had a delayed presentation of acute MI. Um, and so I think, you know, I often think about this when we're sent patients where the time course is unclear, um, you know, if you have a uh, basically a patient presenting where it looks like there may just be a completed infarct, I think it's a very different conversation with them. Um, but by definition, these were not patients that had chronic total occlusions. And actually, you know, in terms of what our goals are, I think they're very different. Um, and really what we highlight as our rationale for the first, second, and third reason that we're doing this is for symptom benefit. I think all the other potential benefits are a lot murkier and take a lot more conversation. Um, but lastly, I think in terms of assessing patient symptoms, what we've learned over time is that we probably underestimate patient angina burden in a number of cases. So there's been some work on that, looking at the Seattle angina questionnaire, which is a validated tool uh, in evaluating that versus the primary physician perspective of whether the patient was having angina. And about 42% of patients were having more than monthly angina that was underrecognized by their physician. Um, I think, you know, as patients stabilize or improve and they think they're kind of doing how we want and that this is something they have to live with, um, this, this is relatively common. And so sometimes when people are told they have a different option, they have a very different perspective. So I think it's just important to remember, um, you know, not everybody is going to complain of typical chest pain, just beyond exertion, obviously fatigue. And there's even been some studies from OpenCTO looking at depression overlapped with this. And it's probably more of that general milieu that people just have poor exercise tolerance um, and more chronic symptoms and also have adjusted their lifestyle quite a bit to avoid being symptomatic. Now, of course, if someone just says, you know, I need to take extra naps um, now as compared to a few years ago, that's really hard to guarantee that they have a strong symptomatic uh, improvement by a coronary intervention of any type in stable ischemic heart disease. And so I think when we look at that, we consider the territory. And again, physiologic testing is helpful. And this is where we often will send folks for a stress pet, nuclear angiogram, stress echo, et cetera, you know, just for corroborating data. Um, and I think the next is when we said, well, you know, it's, it's too risky and it's usually unsuccessful. And I think obviously historically this was quite challenging, um, but what I hope to kind of convince you is that, you know, one success rates are on the rise and there's a lot of training opportunities for all of us to continue to get better, to be able to offer this in a safer fashion for our patients as well. So if we look at NCDR again, several years ago, this was, um, you know, it's a large cohort, but looking at the, the 
sampling of operators is a little bit smaller. And if we look from 2009 to 2013, in this uh, general procedural success, uh, or at least reported to NCDR, went from 58% to 62%. So there was some increase, but it's actually highly variable and appeared to be related to operator volume. But only eight operators actually reported in this study report reported doing more than 50 CTO cases annually. And so I think what that sort of highlighted is that that was also inversely proportional to MACE, I think, which we look at later. And so kind of considering that, it's a difficult thing to dabble in, um, but there's a lot of things that your time is asked to. So, you know, you need to be an expert in TAVR and a number of other growing structural interventions. Um, maybe you do a lot of peripheral work, which may overlap with the CTO space, but, you know, can be kind of a different beast and certainly the patient selection may be different. So I think there's a lot that, that's asked of us. And, and so it's important to kind of look at that and how we can improve our success rates. Um, if we look, you know, at open CTO registry, I lean on this a lot for the data when I'm counseling patients and I think is a very realistic um, um, representation of our current practice. So uh, the nice thing about this is this was a uh, thousand consecutive patients. It's at about 10 centers across the US, North America. And these were all consecutive patients that were um, tracked as well with the NCDR to make sure that we weren't just selecting patients and didn't miss anybody there. Uh, overall, it was a high median JCTO score. Um, there were a lot of post-cabbage patients, it was over about 30%. Importantly, there's no crossover here. This is just a consecutive registry of all CTO patients. They did have core lab adjudicated follow-up. And so we know um, based off that, that procedural success defined as you know lack of vindication, um, of restoration of flow and lack of significant perforation was in 81% of the patients as compared to about 85% that was investigator reported. And so, you know, overall comparing to other registries, this is actually um, a little bit lower than some that had approached more like 90%, but at least these were consecutive patients referred and, and generally had a high complexity indication. In terms of um, the data that we also get from there, because of this adjudication dedicated follow-up, we have pretty good capture of at least up to one month uh, in terms of death from any cause was just under 1%. Uh, MI was about two and a half percent and they had no strokes reported here. If we compare that to a number of the trials that have been done recently, we know that in the Explorer trial, for instance, these were patients coming with STEMI who were evaluated for CTO PCI as well um, as their as their culprit lesion uh, treatment, of course. This had four month follow-up. Uh, death from any causes expected to be higher because this is a STEMI population. If we compare that to the decision CTO trial at five years, which has longest follow-up, uh, we had 91% reported procedural success, but there's some other limitations that we're gonna get into in just a second here. Um, but I think still gives us a, an indication you know, in general of what kind of success rate we're seeing and, and that certainly is improving as well as some of these long-term outcomes. Um, just while we have this up, I just wanted to, as we transition into talking a little bit about this data, I wanna highlight that the patient populations are probably rather different if we look um, at these different rates of death for many cause, if, granted at five years versus one year. Um, MI was up to 12% in terms of the decision CTO, CTO trial and 1% risk of stroke, which would be fairly expected. Um, but importantly, we're also looking at, you know, patient's baseline and follow-up uh, Seattle angina questionnaires here, which we're gonna get into a little bit. So this all brings me to the next uh, item where people say, oh, well, it's just really interesting because there's no data to support CTO PCI. And I think this is an interesting question for us in general with the stable ischemic heart disease population. Obviously we have ischemia trial, Orbita, you know, many factors that are kind of there in the background that are questioning, uh, that have folks questioning a, a lot of the practice that we do. Um, on the flip side, I think we have patients that present to us all the time who are highly symptomatic despite medical therapy, and, and that's a very different conversation. And then folks with ischemic cardiomyopathy where we're trying to offer them you know, some treatment um, to potentially change the course of their disease. And so I think that's really what it comes down to. And these are a few of the studies that we do lean on uh, in terms of some data to try to understand a little bit about our patient selection. Um, What's challenging though, and I think for the investigators who did these trials, they should be applauded for attempting to give us a lot more information, but there's a lot of limitations for randomized trials in this uh, CTO PCI population. If we look at decision CTO, um, after about seven years, they actually finally stopped due to slow enrollment. They had 830 patients, which you know is quite significant. 
but the patients were actually randomized before their non-CTO PCI as well. Um, and I can see some uh, thought process behind that, but we weren't really just testing the CTO intervention per se. So it was sort of patients who were being in the course of revascularization, they may or may not have had persistent symptoms after that. And so we saw improvement overall in terms of that, um, you know, patients reported symptoms, but they were also being treated concomitantly um, for non-CTO PCI. One of the really important things is crossover was actually 18% within three days of randomization. And so I think if we're looking at patients who are willing to undergo a high-risk procedure, you know, we literally just try to scare them with the consent process a bit to have an honest conversation about what some of the possible outcomes can be in terms of complications. And so patients that are willing to undergo that for an elective procedure generally have a pretty significant impact on their quality of life. Um, and so I think that's just a challenging cohort when you're trying to keep them uh, per protocol in your study. And overall, post hoc analysis showed that this, as a result, this was quite underpowered for a number of these reasons. Now, if we compare that to the Euro CTO trial, they also were plagued with slow enrollment and they had about a quarter of the patients that they had, uh, or a third of the patients that they had originally planned to enroll. They were randomized after non CTO PCI in two to one fashion. So that helped a bit with the power. And they also suffered from some limitations with crossover, um, but at a lower rate. And so what we saw in decision CTO, keeping all that in mind, there was no real change in the quality of life assessments. And both groups had an improvement in their early status scores. And these patients were followed up to five years. And so I think if we're looking at that, you know, that's harder to piece together. And we're also doing another intervention on a non-CTO uh, non vessel. And so, you know, I think the number needed to treat to find there is going to be very large. Um, and there's all the factors that we, we mentioned there in terms of crossover. Now, if we look at Euro CTO, the percentage of patients um, that had improvement overall with PCI was higher with the, as compared to optimal medical therapy. And again, this is really how we're counseling patients in terms of the potential benefits there is that this is gonna be symptomatic. Uh, improvement largely. So if we're dealing with patients who are in your class one angina group, and we generally tell them, you know, I'm not sure what you're going to notice. There are people who get a little, who say, oh, in retrospect, I can do more, but is that really important to your current quality of life? As compared to the patients in the class three or class four angina group, we're going to see that those, um, those are the cohorts that really shrink in terms of the PCI cohort as well. So looking at all of that, um, I think these are important things for when we're considering how to treat our patients. Again, I mentioned um, we lean a lot on the open CTO registry because it had consecutive patients. So we're not cherry picking based off anatomy. It's core lab adjudicated. So it's not, you know, the operator and their biases and, you know, kind of the hope that we're doing a good job and, and having good results. And by linking it to NCDR, we made sure that we weren't missing folks. Again, this was a pretty complex population. So they were over a third were post cabbage um, and still had an 86% adjudicated success rate. But importantly, we noticed that the perforation rates were rather high. And so if we're comparing this to some of the registries um, that were more about you know, 5%, this seemed higher and about half of them were clinical. And we got lots of information that's been looked at from there. But what we did see is that overall symptom relief was the indication that we were after more than anything. There were folks with um, large burdens of ischemia based off stress tests, et cetera, that that was really the main driver or that we were trying to achieve complete revascularization in patients who had a percutaneous um, route as compared to cabbage, uh, low EF, other indications such as that, um, or just reduced EF overall. Um, in terms of the appropriate use criteria, over half of them had an appropriate indication, many of those were actually maybe appropriate with another 20% and another 20% were unmappable. Um, but overall, the rarely appropriate was quite low. And so I think this is important when we're looking at the patient population that this tends to reflect our true practice, or at least what those goals are. Now I'm looking at that um, baseline scores in the red here and one month follow up in the blue. If we're looking at Seattle angina questionnaire scores, uh, Rose Dyspnea and the physician health questionnaire, overall, all those um, improved at one month. And it made sense if we looked at the, broke down the groups as well, that the most symptomatic patients are gonna show the biggest benefit, um, which makes a lot of sense and similar to what we've seen in other trials um, like ischemia, et cetera. So if we look at all of that, well, you know, how are we getting better and how can we, if we could select all the right patients, you know, what could we do about that anyway? And I think, you know, one of the big game changers here was introducing different ways of crossing these lesions. The hybrid algorithm uh, was sort of the initial algorithm looking at, 
how to choose your technical strategy and how to importantly, you know, switch strategies if this if this wasn't working. Since then, there's been a lot of algorithms that I think can seem overwhelming. A lot of what they emphasize is, you know, how committed you are to just crossing intraplaque or in the true lumen of the vessel. Um, what we know is that's actually very challenging to tell uh, for sure as, as you're doing this, just because you cross true lumen to true lumen with the integrated wiring or retrograde wiring doesn't mean that you're not actually um, subintimals for some piece of that there. And we have some growing data to support that the outcomes actually um, are not contingent on that, but more on outflow in your distal target uh, territory size, et cetera. So when should we take, um, if we're thinking about all of this and we're gonna get into a lot of the technical aspects, I think the simple question is when should we take on a patient for CTO PCI? And the answer is almost never ad hoc and this should almost always be a staged procedure. I think there's a few cases um, when patients are having an acute MI from vein graft occlusion where we know that the rates of um, you know, pretty significant MACE rates are quite high from uh, those interventions when you're full of clot, et cetera. And if you can use the vein graft as a conduit, we sometimes will uh, do that if we think native PCI is truly safer. Um, but that's really the rarity. And of course, you have to be able to have that set up um, in the moment. And, you know, oftentimes these are cases even so where it's discovered at one of our hospitals and we transfer over with that in mind um, because the patient's failing just medical therapy. In general, an um, adequate angiogram angiogram review really takes time in these cases. We wanna be sure to consider all of our options and have a plan A, a plan B, et cetera, because part of this is our efficiency on the table is important for the patient's safety. Um, we always tell folks that if we are at about three hours and we haven't made progress, then we have failed for that day. And that doesn't mean we can't come back a different time, but when you're five hours into a case, it's not a good moment for the patient to have a complication and you and yourself um, and your staff are often fatigued as well. And so I think it's just important to consider that maybe reevaluating, trying a different strategy or having um, more input onto the case can be helpful at that time. So that's generally our practice as well. Um, but it really allows us to anticipate challenges. We plan our access, our setup is adequate um, and we stay away from some of the common pitfall, pitfalls there. Now, of course, the biggest one I think is just that this should be a situation of shared decision making with the patient. And so I think, um, you know, early in my training when I was, when we would see patients in clinic, uh, it was a little bit of a running joke, but it's not far from the truth that if I didn't make the partner or friend, family member, et cetera, um, at least cry during the consent process, they said I wasn't doing my job correctly. And so I think we want to bring people, you know, back to the moments where we've had complications and say, do we all feel like this was worth it? Because you know, we, we realized what our indications were and we were in. Um, and I think that's really important because when we have had patients go to the ICU with a pericardial drain and we're up checking on them a half hour after the procedure, you know, oftentimes the first thing that they'll say is, when are we going back? And at that point, we're like, okay, well, we'll do a follow-up visit. That's a conversation for another time. We'll see if you want to even do that. Um, we had a pretty significant complication. We need to talk about how this affects, you know, our thoughts about risk going forward. If, you know, if we have different options, et cetera, um, or if that's something that we could avoid in the future, of course, with a lot of unknowns there. And, you know, a lot of the patients say to their family member, to the staff, um, et cetera, who are questioning that, that, well, you don't live with this every day. And so I think if we're really selecting people who are that motivated because of their quality of life limitations, um, then obviously, you know, that's kind of what makes us feel that this is warranted because these are higher risk procedures. Um, so getting down to the nitty gritty, I'm going to shift gears a little bit into how we do this. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on integrated wire escalation because, you know, this in general is kind of the same strategy that we employ in the, all the other PCI that we're doing. There's thousands of wires. And so that can be overwhelming, but in general, I think um, our practice is to just have about four to five basic uh, wires in your integrated wire escalation strategy. You're going to start with soft, simple, safe wires. Um, although even those can cause dissection or purse, we found if you're trying to integrate wire and you don't know where you are, you get into a small branch or we get lost. Um, even, you know, a really, a really soft wire designed across collaterals can actually cause a perforation. So we're always wary of that being the safest strategy. Um, I think it really depends on the case and your ambiguity and other things that come up. Um, and because this is just one strategy, it really doesn't augment your success rate. Um, you know, there are folks who get 
uh, as you become more facile with different wiring techniques and, and different wires, that can certainly improve your initial success. But there really hasn't been any change as a field over time if we just look at integrated wire escalation as, as the sole strategy. And if, again, back to open PCI, open CTO registry, excuse me. The first strategy typically was integrated wire escalation in the small majority of cases, um, but was certainly not the successful one in, in all of those, and, and again, about 40%. And so I think it's an important consideration. You need to be comfortable with uh, the set of wires that you have, but it's something that we have to be careful about getting too wedded to one strategy. Um, and what I've actually found in my early practice that the most tempting cases are the ones where you think that your integrated wire is starting to go and you really want that to work because that just makes the certainty of the case, um, you know, all much more, you know, early on, you're, you're quite certain about how to manage this, what our success is going to be, and what the issues all kind of come back to a more comfortable level. We don't have the same uh, additional issues and questions that we have with these other techniques that we'll go through. And so I think at times we get a little too focused on that. And that's when you're trying to find the right branch, but you're sending ejected wire out a small distal branch and you can get a wire perf there, or we're dealing with ambiguity and actually we're you know, finding ourselves exiting the vessel um, because we're too committed to that technique. And so I think there are times where that's really what we have to do to get started, but there's a number of other ways that actually, um, I believe, do increase the, uh, the safety and the success rate of the procedure. Um, so just to go through some of these others in terms of integrated dissection reentry, um, but for any case, this this is an integrated dissection reentry case, I believe. But the for any case, we're going to first define what your target vessel is, and I think this weighs uh, quite a bit. So this is looks like a pretty healthy distal target. Um, you know, when we're comparing things with the surgeons, we both want the same things. If you have a big territory, um, there's not a ton of diffuse disease in the distal vessel, then we feel a lot more confident about our outcomes. And part of that is because of obviously the long-term stent durability, but also our success rates here. So we have a proximal cap um, that is somewhat ambiguous. We have some side branches here, um, but the distal cap is not too ambiguous. And we also have a nice landing zone here, a good distal RCA target. And so when we're looking at these, um, I often will start integrate here be thinking that if we're subintimal, we have a good uh, location for integrated dissection uh, reentry as a, in a targeted fashion. And if that fails, then we're all set up to try to go retrograde and perform reverse cart actually. So once we get in here, our goal is to get subintimal pretty quickly if the wire just doesn't cross because the more wiring we do, again, we end up in small branches. We make these tracks that are now more challenging to get out of. Sometimes we have to use um, special techniques like base, uh, we blow up a balloon and we're trying to intentionally uh, with balloon assisted subintimal integrated uh, entry, we're trying to actually get into the, the subintimal space by creating some dissection planes there um, uh, by ballooning fairly aggressively in disease. And so by doing that, um, we can you know, successfully track the main architecture of the vessel. Once we get around the corner here, we wanna use some blunt dissection tool. So um, historically that had been a cross box. We've been moving more towards um, other small you know, wires that are designed to make smaller knuckles. But regardless of the technique, we're just gonna track subintimally here until our distal landing zone that we knew um, from our initial setup shot. And this really highlights just how important dual access is uh, because even if you think you might wire integrate, you know, there's really no good way to tell where you are in these cases without disrupting the vessel architecture with an integrated picture unless you have dual access and retrograde visualization. And so actually the most challenging cases are when we only have ipsilateral collaterals and not a good way to navigate that. Um, so then, you know, in current practice, the Stingray low profile balloon is brought down and this has two exit ports um, that are at 180 degrees apart from each other here. And that gives us a way to target re-entry from the subintimal space back towards the true lumen. Of course, you don't always know which side that is. You can sometimes tell from your actual um, retrograde an angiogram, but you're gonna see here, you know, there's a wire uh, exiting the side port. And then as we advance that, that appears to free up here. Um, and as we bring this back, it appears to free up and be true lumen. But we don't know that for sure. And this is an important time um, to have a gut check. And this is when our visualization from retrograde injection can be 
so useful. Now, if we do this with just a stiff non-jacketed wire, it rolls over, appears to be true lumen, and we can confirm that with a retrograde injection, then we know um, that we're good. We just need to carefully get that gear out and exchange back for a safe workhorse wire uh, and also to confirm our location. Uh, so if we're able to do that, that's called stick and go. If uh, more commonly, we'll do something called stick and swap where you then follow the pathway that you just made with that stick uh, that stiff non-jacketed wire. And then we have, um, you know, a, a jacketed wire of with a little bit more tip load. So this is commonly a Raider, or Pilot 200, a Gladius. And there's a number um, that are quite similar uh, that you can use. And really just the angle of that bend is really important so that you're able to exit the side port. And so you need that to be short um, and at a sufficient angulation that we can actually exit there. And so in these cases, you know, I think part of the mental uh, difficulty of it is that we don't really know for sure that ever, how everything looks until the very end. Um, we can take a retrograde injection to ensure that we're actually in the architecture. It's helpful if we can uh, move the wire forward during this just to be sure that you see that moving freely and appears to be all set here in our main branch. Um, and so now we just need to very carefully watch that wire because again, we're working on jacketed wire until we exchange back for a microcatheter. If you notice here, um, we have a guide extension, which is really helpful for hematoma management because we want to try to plug that inflow. We've made a knuckle um, in the subintimal space. There's no outflow yet at that point. And so that hematoma will just continue to grow. And so working efficiently and really trying to block any further inflow is important. But this is also why an integrated injection can really doom your case. Um, never mind perforation, et cetera, just because we don't have any outflow here. Um, of course, a, a really good way in many of these cases is not contrast injections, but actually just exchanging for a workhorse. And we know from our initial setup shots, generally our landmarks, and that's a safer way to try to advance our wire. Um, and so I think hopefully this case highlights a little bit of how an integrated dissection reentry is really most ideal when we have a good distal target. So we have a, a nice um, area to try to reenter into and that we have adequate visualization, uh, keeping hematoma management really uh, all together. And so like many of these cases, we don't know until we're pretty much all done. We've stunted the inflow and the outflow. Um, we have some expected dissection planes at times. Um, so we just wanna make sure that that's all covered with the stent. Um, and generally with the help of IVIS and your retrograde injection is how you're making all of these decisions prior to that. So we lean very heavily on it in those cases. Now, what's changed over the years? I think we've developed a number of ways to try to improve hematoma management. Part of that is just working efficiently. And so if we start to work in the subintimal space and we advance some of our gear, it's not a time to try to rewire for a prolonged period of time. Um, you know, we know that the success rate of that is quite low and that will actually get worse as your hematoma um, is growing. There's a number of wire-based strategies that are really the same thing as a Stingray LP. This is just a device that's designed to try to assist with that. Um, but otherwise you can do effectively the same thing by just using the angle, uh, angulated wire um, in a microcatheter and trying to puncture back in um, and then follow that with a jacketed wire. And those techniques have been described as well. Um, and so altogether, you know, as part of that efficiency piece to minimize your hematoma and to manage that, um, we've started using probably less cross boss and other wires that are designed um, that generally have a smaller knuckle so that you have still a small area of hematoma at your distal landing zone. But be, if we're able to very rapidly exchange out for uh, the stingray and re-enter before that hematoma grows, that that's probably the best, um, and in particular using guide extensions to block the inflow. Um, but, you know, retrograde is really popular as well. And so for looking at those techniques are all evolving. Well, you know, even a few years ago, we were saying that retrograde CTO PCI has about three times the associated risk of MACE as compared to anti-grade strategies. And so we took this pretty seriously when we were considering our strategies for patients. Um, but importantly, from open CTO, we learned that actually 60% of the perforations that we saw with cases where both retrograde and integrated techniques were used were actually caused by the integrated approaches and retrograde techniques were used to solve our issues in those cases. And so um, I think that really fits with a lot of the things that I've seen where, again, we kind of get started integrate, you're hoping that you're gonna be able to wire. Um, we run into difficulties doing that or ADR, we get lost and then to solve the problem, we go retrograde. And so I think one of the things that I've tried to incorporate is not to get so wedded to my first idea. So plan A or plan B are not always gonna work. Um, and I think the, the quicker that we change over and look at alternatives, if something isn't going very well, uh, probably the safer for 
patients because that's when, when we're trying something too hard is often some of the difficulty. Um, and so if we again, look at this, this is retrograde dissection reentry or reverse car oftentimes, um, retrograde wire escalation. These, uh, those cases were, were actually somewhat less than half. And so of the perforations that were contributed. So not that all of these don't uh, carry increased risk. Um, and certainly they're not all retrograde cases are, are created equal. So if we're talking about using a uh, dying being graft as part of the conduit, you know, the risks related to that are very different than using an, epic an epicardial collateral and actually septal uh, collaterals in general, perforations there are very well tolerated, except for a few cases, um, and in particular, where we're most likely to have perforations is embedded within the myocardium, and those tampon not off, actually, uh, in almost all, in many of the cases, and really almost all of them are well tolerated. Rarely in the very distal septals, you can have um, pericardial effusion because they actually have an epicardial course or quite distal. And so we're mindful of all of that. But the, the really the, the risks that we're most cautious about are these epicardial collaterals. So this is an analysis of perforations from open CTO by Taisha Hira and others. And I think this is really quite useful because they saw a number of factors. So the high-risk perforations uh, tended to be proximal in the main vessel. Um, and very large had certain shapes associated with them. But if we look at the epicardial perforations, there were eight. Um, all of them were clinically significant and needed treatment. And actually half of those were resulted in death. And so out of the eight deaths in open out of a thousand patients, um, four of these came from epicardial perforations. And so, um, and again, these were in hospital deaths within, uh, happened to be, and we're all within 30 days. So I think the, um, you know, this really gives us a lot of important feedback in terms of some of the things that we've tried to do to evolve to avoid that. So one of these is called symptomal tracking and reentry. Um, and we kind of think of this of failing with style. So when we've tried other techniques and they haven't really been fruitful in the case, but we have maybe a fairly juicy epicardial, but we think it's pretty risky as well for in terms of perforation, um, in particular in post cabbage patients where this is a territory that you can't uh, easily access um, in terms of managing any issues with hematoma compression um, and, and localized tamponade, then you know we're quite mindful about what these risks are. And so this is a way that we can decrease our failure and defer stenting, uh, excuse me, decrease our failure rates overall. But I think importantly, what we've learned compared to the initial description of this technique is that we need to defer stenting. We basically use this as a investment procedure and we need to optimize outflow ultimately. Um, finally, there's you know some variation here in terms of how much you're trying to actually gain outflow at the time versus just using this as an investment procedure where we've gotten some work done, we've modified the proximal cap, we're going to let things heal up and come back. Um, this is just one example, many cases that we've had. This is a 50-year-old gentleman who had very significant angina, um, but as well as heart failure and an EF of 20%. Um, for a number of, you know, kind of personal reasons, he didn't go undergo cabbage, so he had his LAE treated. Um, and then was referred to us for our CACTO. And I think, you know, this is again, one of those patients where he has ongoing symptoms, he has low EF, um, you know, he's young. So if we're looking at his, you know, in terms of the patients that may benefit from more complete revask, I think he is more likely to, in terms of, um, you know, that and his relatively few comorbidities overall, uh, recognizing that the data there um, is really hard to counsel an individual patient, but, it, you know, talking to him, he was so symptomatic. I think that really wasn't as, as relevant uh, in any case, but certainly from a cardi cardiomyopathy perspective, um, where he had basically viability throughout on a thallium, no less, uh, then I think that's pretty, um, we feel pretty comfortable about what we're doing. Now, that being said, um, when we get in here, this is his RCA CTO, looks like we might just be able to wire this, we'll see, but you know, we don't wanna, that's not a good, uh, good strategy if, um, if we're just gonna hope that that's gonna work. What we're most worried about is that he does have some uh, distal cap that's nearing the bifurcation. So we need to just be careful about where exactly we're going to do our landing. Um, and a knuckle wire was advanced and using this blunt dissection technique, once we're subintimal, uh, the wire ended up being advanced here down to the distal target. Um, stingray was attempted down here, but unfortunately was unsuccessful. Uh, and so we actually tried going retrograde a number of times and the patient could not tolerate that. So it became quite clear that in his particular case, he was going to need hemodynamic support to be able to do that. And I think you know, reasonable people would disagree about 
how to best approach that. Um, but at the time, you know, this was sort of an evolving part of our practice. And so actually um, the star technique was used where we're advancing the knuckle. Um, again, these are wires generally with a rapid transition. So they tend to fold over within the subintimal space. And because of that, um, they often will re-enter near a branch point where they'll basically fall back into the true lumen. And when we do that, we have to be most careful about what branches are we losing here. And so really these are ideal for an OM where you basically have one single main branch target. And if we're able to re-enter fairly early um, in a case where ADR is not very effective, we maybe avoid a high risk epicardial collateral. Now in this case, this was not the preferred strategy, um, but just that he was really not tolerating any of the retrograde techniques um, due to hypotension and, and getting pretty sick in the cath lab. As we go through here, we see um, the true lumen actually wrapping around the vessel here as we're in the subintimal space. And so I think it's important to kind of get used to looking at that and trying to find our reentry areas. So again, we sort of balloon based off IVIS, our retrograde angiogram, um, and trying to identify that. Now, like we often say, this is an artery only we could love, and there certainly are some dissection planes down to the bifurcation here that we have to be mindful of. Um, but in general, these actually with DAPT heal rather well. So I think you know we're very mindful of dissections overall in our general practice for PCI. Um, but in a number of cases, you know, I think we've learned that over time in the stable ischemic heart disease patient population, if we have outflow, um, DAPT is really quite protective. And I think there's a sweet spot here after several weeks where we bring people back. So we try to make that around the two month mark um, nowadays. I think there's still a lot to learn about how to optimize utilization of this technique. And it's certainly not the preferred strategy. But I think in cases where um, we certainly are having a change in safety um, in terms of other techniques, uh, it's something to consider. And we can see here he's actually reversed his flow in that collateral. Um, and this is just, you know, again, another case where um, the way in terms of that healed was actually somewhat surprising because we thought the PDA wasn't really going to come in. Um, and when the patient came back, it actually looked quite well and we were able to stand up to the bifurcation. So again, these are quality of life procedures for 90% of the cases that we're doing. Um, and so if we're able to avoid high risk scenarios, maybe this is one solution, but we're trying to study this and still have a lot to learn admittedly. Um, so in the last few minutes, I just want to go through a case that I think kind of highlights um, moving through a number of the solution, uh, a number of the issues that we ran into and some of the potential solutions. So, so this is actually just a couple of weeks ago, um, one of our partners from a sister hospital brought a patient over who had persistent angina uh, despite escalation of drugs, and he was very intolerant to long-acting nitrates, kept ending up in the ER because he thought he had a concussion, his headaches were so bad. So um, that wasn't really a strategy working for him. So again, we have a long conversation about kind of what we're after. His EF is about 45%. He's doing okay, but he just feels like he can't do any of the activities that he used to, um, isn't able to play golf, trying to get more active now as we're getting outside again, and uh, just having a lot of difficulty with that. So a few things happen here. Um, first, uh, we're radial femoral. That tends to be a very common approach. I think we're pretty comfortable with femoral access and really focus on trying to be meticulous about it. So I don't have a high rate of biradial in my practice, but in non-post-cabbage uh, yeah, non patients is actually kind of a, an area where we tend to utilize this as well. Um, they'd had a lot of trouble getting catheters to sit during the diagnostic. So we kind of figured that for this case, we were gonna go, um, we were going to try uh, femoral in terms of having support for this fairly proximal occlusion as well. But I think, again, you have options here. And if, if the patient profile changes your risk of femoral access, then that's something that we certainly um, can avoid when necessary in a, few, in, in a lot of these cases. So we get a wire down. Uh, in this case, it happened to be a Mongo, but it's a you know little bit intermediate grade um, tip load jacketed wire that seemed to actually potentially be crossing um, true lumen, but we were unable to get the microcatheter down because even with this access, our, our guide support is not outstanding. So we went to swap out for that, um, bring a trap liner in, bring a balloon in to try to improve our, our support with that, and then uh, and then bring the microcatheter back. And in that exchange, you know, teaching somebody here at the table who hadn't used the trap liner before, they're slightly different in terms of the lengths and actually just didn't realize that they're pushing that out. So we kick everything out. Um, we've already ballooned a little bit in there to try to bring this down. So now we have maybe a different strategy. So we pretty quickly got sub mole here because we're otherwise going out a small branch immediately. So then my goals are different. Now we're actually trying to get a knuckle to just 
fold over here so we know that we're in the architecture of the vessel, not going out these tiny invisible branches proximally that are, are not going to be as safe to follow. Um, and return with our guide extension here so we're all set up. Now, I think part of the consideration here is hematoma. So I'm not sure exactly all what's happened um, and transpired, but we have to be prepared for that. So we try to plug the inflow. Um, in this case, it's a trap liner, which is just a guide extension that has a balloon for trapping on the back. It's really helpful in ADR um, because of that, because you're able to leave that in place during your exchanges, um, but certainly isn't always available. And in terms of as a using as a regular guide extension, like many things that achieve two tests, I don't think it works quite as well. It's not quite as durable. Um, we've had some issues with that overall, but works great, I think, in terms of these scenarios for integrated techniques. Um, we bring in the Stingray LP to our distal target, which you can see here, our distal visualization is actually not as good. So what I know already is that we probably have some hematoma formation that I'm concerned about because we're not seeing quite as well down here. So our profile for the stingray in these cases, we want to see basically the two lines that are on the balloons should be overlapped such that you're only seeing one line and we can see two dots there. And that's how we know um, basically from our orientation that our exit ports are one is up and one is down and we're able to follow that. So we seem to get in here, um, but I'm in a small PL branch and I'm not sure that I'm actually re-entering uh, here at the bifurcation. And so after uh, fussing around here, we exchange out for a workhorse wire, um, try to take a dolum catheter to come down and, and wire the PDA as well. And we're clearly you know, going subintimal there or having issues. So at this point, we're gonna flip retrograde. So we've tried integrated wire escalation. We maybe had that, but the guide got kicked out. So we have to deal with that. So now we get subintimal, we advance a small nickel wire down um, and we are failing ADR and I have growing hematoma formation. So at this point, we decide to flip retrograde. So here's our setup shot here. We knew he had some septals to sample. We just got into this cascade. And it's one of those cases where really within about 30 seconds, um, we're able to cross. And so, you know, my staff, this was our last case on a Friday. This was an add-on he was bringing over um, to try to, uh, to learn with us as well. And so, you know, our staff were like, well, why didn't you just start with that? But, you know, in reality, we don't really know. I think we had what appeared to be a good landing zone for integrated dissection reentry. Um, that's something I'm trying to work on in terms of my practice. And we were trying to teach in this case as well. So I think it's important to kind of quickly move through these options because you just don't know what's going to work. And here we see, um, I think this was just a regular Sheon wire. In this case, we also use a Sheon block and septals at times, but it crosses quite easily. And now I actually am up into the PL um, that we want to be in. So of course, we're not done. So in some cases, you're just going to wire retrograde. But in the majority of these, we're going to do reverse cart. And so a lot of the troubleshooting that's important comes down to if you're in the same space, integrate and retrograde. And so I think this thinking about this in cross section can be really helpful. Um, here, the yellow is the intimal plaque, but we often have your integrated guide wire is red and the green guide wire is um, excuse me, the green is retrograde and your integrate is, is red here. And so what we're most interested in is are these in the same place? So if you have one in the true lumen, one in the false lumen, um, it, you're connecting your dots is going to be more difficult as compared to when you're both in the uh, false lumen, that's actually really the benefit of reverse cart in terms of in optimizing our, our crossing. And so this works well in areas where you have longer lesions and we have a longer subintimal space, both integrated and retrograde to work in. And what we're looking for is where we see that overlap most um, occur, we blow up a balloon integrate and that creates a larger potential space, which we're then advancing our retrograde wire into. And so we're gonna do retrograde wire escalation here in terms of trying to access that space um, you want something that's torqueable. We need to get our microcatheter up to there. And so our retrograde guide support is important in this case. Um, and here, what we were actually able to do is um, help get our microcatheter across. I didn't use a guide extension in this case just because he had a little disease in the left main that I was being a little bit nervous about. Um, and a radial guide here is tending to, uh, to push out a little bit. But what we were able to do is actually pin our retrograde wire with our integrated balloon once those were in the same space get our uh, retrograde microcatheter a little bit closer. And then we just take, um, again, typically ejected, highly torqueable wire um, of your choosing. You need a longer bend on here. And we just need to get into the guide extension now. Once I'm there, I can actually pin that with this balloon that we have in there. Um, and then we can get our microcatheter around, uh, externalize on a long wire, and then we just have to do normal PCI. Um, now, again, we have some hematoma formation from our earlier integrade techniques. 
Um, we're using IVIS in our retrograde injection to really focus on that. Um, and I think, you know, because of some of those earlier um, misadventures, we actually have a little bit of issue with the PL, although it's hanging in there. And so, and this is our, um, our IVIS run. It's somewhat challenging to tell if you don't have good landmarks of where we're subintimal uh, and where we're true women. And so I showed this in part just to show how challenging that can be, but you catch the, the true lumen compressed here a few times kind of wrapped around the vessel. Um, and that runs a little bit too fast as well. Um, so this is his final result. You know, we know there's gonna be some dissection planes here that we need to tack up. Um, and so avoid taking antegrade pictures. I know that they're there if we have a clinical problem, but overall we're avoiding antegrade pictures until we've covered that with our stents or at least balloon to have good outflow. Um, and so I wanna wrap up there in case there's questions or other comments. Um, but in general, I think, you know, I try to take our approach that we're, we're treating patients, not angiograms. And so it really comes back to indications, but being realistic that these procedures are higher risk um, than the types of things that would have already been done before we are getting to this conversation with the patient. They failed medical therapy um, and that their indications really are our best guide to, to try and to making these care planning decisions. And that really it's a shared decision-making uh, tool. So there's times where, you know, there's folks who are, highly active who don't seem all that symptomatic. And I think we're all a little loathe, you know, thinking about potential harm for a patient. Um, but if it's part of a shared decision-making process, we feel pretty confident in terms of, you know, whether we're comfortable proceeding with that. Um, I think there's lots of technical advancements that have increased our success rates, but really a lot of the focus in addition to that right now in the CTO space is how can we improve our patient selection and also how can complication management become uh, a bigger part of our training so that we can do these more safely. And then is an important part of any, you know, any of us for our PCI practice, but certainly in the CTO space is what am I working towards today? So there's, you know, technical uh, aspects that we're working on implementing all of this in your cath lab in terms of training staff and your partners, et cetera, um, you know, can, is a big part of this as well. And how can we improve the safety of these procedures is, is always at the forefront. Um, so with that, I will stop, but thank you so much for having me. Um, this is my contact information. If anybody has other thoughts or questions. That was outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Kearney, for that introduction and comprehensive discussion of CTO PCI. I have a, a, a few questions for you. I wanted to talk a little bit about this relationship between the epicardial coronary artery and the microvasculature, um, which you brought up early on. Mm -hmm. And your uh, point was that the outflow is important, the territory and the size of that territory is important. And I'm kind of wondering how you go about assessing that when you're evaluating the patient up front for whether or not they'd be a good candidate. Because as you said, you know, you can look at the angiogram, you can you can devise a technical approach. But the question is gonna be, is it worth it? And so what do you use? Do you use you know nuclear testing? Are you looking at viability, wall motion, exercise testing? What allows you to figure out whether this microvasculature is going to benefit from you revascularizing the epicardial coronary? Yeah, that's such an important question. I think uh, in patients where they clearly have symptoms and they have a normal EF, we don't rely as heavily on um, on that ancillary data, I will say, because I think, you know, there if it's like we're 99% sure they're going to have a symptomatic improvement and their uh, left ventricular function is normal. It's really more about their symptom guided care. Of course, you have to have some territory in mind um, with any of these. And so, you know, kind of the classic one is there's, you know, diagonal or something that we're kind of loath to put the LED at any risk for uh, in any regard. And everybody's a little bit like, oh, should we really be undertaking this? Um, but I think in cases where, you know, especially post cabbage patients where there's lots of little areas of the the pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to put together. That's where stress pet is helpful, just I think because of the resolution, um, we can get some coronary blood flow uh, estimates from that as well. So that's kind of our most fa uh, favorite approach in terms of those cases when we're just trying to decide what are our real targets here and, and what's the territory when that really isn't clear on the angiogram. Um, in a number of cases, I think, you know, part of the retraining of our eyes with some of this is that it's not always what the vessel looks like because it's, we know that these are underfilled. So we see that acutely in the cases actually, um, especially the ones where, 
you know, we have limited, we're, we're just able to wire these and we're using OCT. Um, we have some nice examples where we actually are seeing the size increase pretty significantly right there on the table. So we, you know, do a little bit of ballooning. We do our initial imaging. We aren't, if there's cases where I'm not really trusting that right away, um, give some nitro, et cetera, and we give it a little bit of time, actually, sometimes they'll actually increase in size even on a second run. So we know that the kind of size of the vessel that we see down there is not always representative of that. So we're looking at the overall territory in terms of the, the bed. So if there's lots of branches there, it's a big area of the wall that's not filled and it sort of fits with their stress test or um, that's really our only anatomical target, then we're more motivated to get in there. Um, but it's a really important question and there's a number of patients where the you know all the details are really murky so they have a little bit of a low ef but no obvious wall motion abnormalities um and i think that's where nuclear testing in particular seems to be helpful for us in our practice um, but there's no perfect answer i think it's something we really need to be studying going forward um overall in terms of viability you know i think it's another you know just big uh, question in terms of question mark in terms of how we approach these. Certainly in patients with low EF and we're trying to decide what to go after first if they have multiple targets um, or you know if there's wall motion abnormalities on their echo that really suggest that this might just be a completed infarct. You know, I think nobody is very motivated to go after a totally aneurysmal apex if that's really all you're getting at with the, with the distal LED. But if you have a pox LED and a low EF and it's kind of global, um, you know, in general, it's like, well, how much do we rely on viability testing given the data? And so I think we sort of put this in conjunction with, you know, are they very dilated if their heart has really looked more like a basketball for a couple of years um, over time, then I think our there's a bigger question mark of how much of this is going to be reversible. And so then we bring in our heart team in terms of, you know, durable heart failure therapy options and some other things that are an important consideration before we ever discuss revask in, in that kind of patient population. So um, kind of a mixed bag, but I think low AF patients, we do often lean on viability. I think MRI gives us the most data, um, but then we're kind of looking at that in terms of what our targets are. Many of those patients have multiple, or if we think they have a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and we're, and we're trying to assess this as well. And then a lot of that is, where, you know, what areas are not uh, visualized at all on the angiogram or, or would be covered by this as opposed to the actual vessel size, um, because we know that that's, you know, underfilled at the time and, and may not be representative, but certainly lots to learn. And I think I'm hopeful that, you know, as we're all doing more invasive physiology overall, um, Alan Jeremiah, since some folks are interested in looking at a lot of these further when, you know, with our initial crossing, if we can get some more physiology data, which hopefully will give us some other indicators as well. Sorry, long-winded answer. Have another question. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I think that that's, this is kind of um, a challenge. And certainly, you know, we don't do routine post-stress testing after CTO revascularization to see what that impact was, right? We don't have like the before and after. We typically will go off of symptoms, as you're saying, because we don't really have a clinical indication for that. So it's in the realm of research. But I guess my other question here is, do you have any... Um, kind of indicators when you're in the procedure, you said, sometimes I, I, I'm doing this as an investment and I may have to do this in two parts. What are the indicators that say to you, this is time to break here and then do this in a second part? Yeah, it's another really good question. I think the way I, we tend to the factors we tend to weigh there are in part, what's what's the risk of doing damage to your distal targets? And so we know, you know, one of the downsides of the STAR procedure is that we're creating these diffuse dissection planes. And if they don't heal well, that can be really challenging. Now, in many cases, they've healed better than what we expected, but again, this is sort of a last resort technique. Um, and so I think being cognizant that sometimes down the road, these can be fibrotic and you know, really change your distal target, which was a healthier vessel originally. And now, you know, now we've extended our dissection planes down there. So if we're running into that, um, a lot of times what we'll just try to do is modify the proximal cap. So maybe it took two hours of trying to get a guide to sit. And we basically are fighting, you know, for each centimeter at a time. Um, but we've modified that or we're dealing with a lot of ambiguity in the proximal cap. And so we were trying to, you know, do these techniques where we re-enter or enter the subintimal space proximal to there and are tunneling around that, um, et cetera. So, and if there's a safety indication in terms of, you know, the patient is two hours in, I need to come back with anesthesia, that certainly is one. But from an anatomical perspective, I think if there's a very good distal target and I'm worried about affecting branches, we'll sometimes just actually 
modify that proximal cap. If we try retrograde and then fail at that, um, then we may pause there that day and come back after some of that has healed because then sometimes our other integrated techniques, um, actually just after some of that healing can be more successful. So I had, you know, one guy, um, I was like, couple of weeks right after I started as an attending and he's 40 something terrible diabetes got turned on for cabbage because his diabetes is so poorly controlled and some other issues, um, that were going on. And so I really wanted to get his diag. I'm doing an LAD CTO and I failed integrated dissection reentry, you know, we have a little bit too big of a hematoma and I'm really concerned about extending that dissection plane further. So we basically intentionally just start into the first diagonal branch and did some proximal cap modification and stopped there that day. You know, he doesn't have good kidneys. I'm worried about contrast. And when we came back, we actually were able to just wire integrate into the LED because the way that had healed. And so that's not going to happen all the time. But I think if we're, you know, the LED territory, we're really worried about where our target is because the main benefit is just all of the, the distal, you know, all the branching and myocardial blood flow that comes from that. Um, so I think it's weighing, you know, each of those options. If I'm working in a circumflex and you're in the, the, OM that you're going to, um, that is your target. And there's not really a whole lot of branches that are at risk there. Then those are cases where, you know, oftentimes we'll just go ahead and, um, and resort to this technique faster in terms of star rather than taking on an epicardial. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, the, the development of all these techniques. You know, this is not something that people gain typically in their year, year of training. And I noticed you know, this data that you had put up on one of your slides, that there are only a few operators who are really doing more than 50 cases a year. And that might be a little bit older now. There yes. might be more, but you were talking about under 10 people, right, in the country. So I guess the question is, number one, how do you develop this technique going forward? Uh, and maybe you can talk a little bit about what you uh, learned or how you developed uh, your technique. And I think the second question is, is, should it be regionally concentrated? You know, should there be sites where we're referring this in, in a regional way, if there really are only a few people who are achieving high enough volume to, to maintain this? Yeah, it's another really important question. I think, as you said, the NCDR data from Burlakis there is, you know, pretty outdated now, but I think it's comparable to some of the other registry things that we've seen. So um, Michigan has looked at their quality um, database, actually, in terms of this as well. And I think it did change my perspective a little bit because what they found is kind of lower volume operators who said, well, I'm just going to, I'll keep it simple. I'll just stay integrated. Um, you know, that kind of uh, strategy actually had the, pretty much the same complication rate as high volume operators that were doing what appeared to be based off other factors, uh, higher complexity of cases. And so I think part of that comes down to options and I, learning from you know my own mistakes of, I really want to wire this. I'm going to keep trying to wire it because I think I'm so close is sometimes where you get into trouble where retrograde would have been a lot safer in that particular case. So um, I think, you know, like anything else, the more we do it um, when it's a different technique, probably the better off we are in terms of our, our success rate and managing complications and avoiding complications, most importantly. Um, so I think some of the data is starting to support that. In terms of training, um, you know, these procedures take a while. The, uh, it's hard to just kind of tack on to your practice when we're asked to do so many things. And so I think part of it is as the interventional space evolves, it's really hard to be an expert on TAVR and mitral valve interventions and CT, coronary CTOs and do peripheral. And so I think a lot of that, um, you know, hopefully we can compartmentalize ourselves a little bit where we all can take care of, we all need to take care of coronary cases, of course, um, that need urgent, uh, need to be addressed urgently, but overall, maybe as part of our practice, this does need to be divvied up. Um, and probably a little bit of a spoken hub model makes sense. There's cases where, you know, especially with a little bit of coaching case selection for an early CTO operator, um, where you can build that skill set safely and you know, really aren't harming the patient's chances of a good outcome, et cetera, and can do that with some support um, and then have an, out, an offset or a, a method for proctoring and some things like that. Because I think that's really what it comes down to is sort of a um, a targeted practice at improving these techniques as opposed to, oh, I do a case here and there and we see what happens is just, if, you know, I'm a little biased from the uh, the training that I had, but I, I think that that was really helpful just because this stuff is is pretty hard and it's quite a bit different than um, what we're doing in our, our usual day-to-day -day otherwise. That was great. Um, and I think lastly, my, my last question has to do with imaging. Um, 
And I noticed you, you put up um, IBIS and you're showing, um, you know, how you're using ultrasound. It, you know, what about any role for CT and fusing the CT with the angiogram? Is that helpful, not helpful? Second, is there any role for OCT here where you might have better resolution, but with the disadvantage of the higher pressure injection? Maybe talk mm -hmm. about other imaging modalities that might be useful or not. Yeah, uh, well, it will say that we as an institution only really ramped up our IBIS use a few years ago because we realized, well, we weren't really doing it. And our guys said, well, I, you know, I size aggressively and I always post still and pre dill and we use so much atherectomy, we don't need it. But we found that as we went from about 25% up to over 90% use of imaging as a whole, that we did see a change in our practice in terms of stent size. Um, and, you know, I think in these complex cases, there's really no other way to do it, quite frankly, you know, that, now that we've learned how to incorporate that efficiently. Um, but it's a really good question. So Farouk uh, Jafar has done some great work looking at um, CT as well as some others. And I think if you have a system where you can overlay those, that's really interesting because one of our biggest barriers is ambiguity. So you have post-cabbage patients where the initial anatomy has been altered, you've got multiple inflows, it's really hard to see. Um, all of your targets, and we might have multiple catheters and in, uh, initially in other graphs just to visualize what our distal landing zone is, and then we get to work. And so our roadmap is, is quite limited. And so I think in those cases, if you have a system where we could overlay that in real time, um, that's where it's most useful. And there are some out there, but they're just not as available in common practice yet. Um, certainly in post-cabbage patients where we've run into issues with ambiguity, that's where we use CT anyway, um, but because we're limited in the real-time application and when we bring the patient to the lab, we don't um, use it as often as we would otherwise. Um, and then to your second question about OCT, I think there is some really interesting um, information that we get out of that in the cases we have used it. I know Jonathan Hill is a CT operator who's really highlighted kind of the, the use of OCT. And he's, he's right that usually by the time we're getting to that phase of a uh, injection, that's okay. I think there's plenty of cases though where um, because we're worried about hematoma propagation and I want to get that imaging in before we do any injections whatsoever, you know, we're basically not even flushing the guide um, until we have those tacked up then. I think in those cases, it's quite limited, but in many others where, you know, you do cross with integrated wiring or we use a retrograde technique and we've already ballooned and have the outflow, um, I think there's places there where we could probably incorporate that more often. Um, and some of the images he's getting and information are really useful. So a few times I have used it, I've been you know, surprised at how great the imaging is, but of course you have to get outflow already. And so if we're using it in the middle of the cases where we don't have good outflow yet, and we're trying to decide how to optimize things, um, you know, then it's just more limited because of its, uh, because of the technology. Well, that was terrific. I think we're at the end of our hour here. And I want to thank everybody for joining us from all over. Uh, I know for you, it's particularly early. What time is it where you are? Oh, now it's 5.30. So <laughs> now it's 5.30, <laughs> yeah. right? 4.30. And what a torture, right? But, um, you know, hopefully uh, we, we've set you off for a very good day. So I want to wish everybody a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night, wherever you are in the world today. And, and I hope it's all a good one. Take care, Dr. Kearney. Thank you so much. This will be available on YouTube should anybody want to review the content. And uh, it's just outstanding work that you're doing there. Thank you very much for joining today. Thanks so much for having me.